Welcome to Time Management, a webinar for AmeriCorps VISTA members. I'm your host, Andy King. Time is an ever-present factor for VISTA members. From your first day, you're aware that the clock is ticking and you have just 365 days to work with. This session is designed to provide practical strategies for making the most of your service year. All of you have made this webinar a priority and have set aside other tasks to be with us right now. And many of you have shared those in the chat. Um, so some of you are working on flyers or fundraising materials. Um, others uh, stopped uh, work that they were doing in interviewing people or, or collecting information um, for a grant proposal. Um, so all of you are making choices and you're making prior, prior, prioritization so that you can be here with us on today's webinar. So we applaud that and um, uh, want to uh, now move in to share with you a little bit about who is with us on our session today. As I mentioned, my name is Andy King. I'm a training specialist for the VISTA program. Assisting me today off screen are Jessica Knight and Amy Kanata from our partner, Education Northwest. You'll see all of us in the chat and the Q&A to assist you during today's session and to help you get your questions answered. Our producer, Andy Clark, will be managing the technology for this session. We're fortunate to have with us Jewel Ware uh, as our lead presenter today. Some of you will know Jewel from VISTA Pre-Service Orientation. Over the last 25 years, Jewel has developed and delivered workshops and presentations, both nationally and internationally, to over 30,000 participants. The audiences have consisted of individuals at many levels within businesses, nonprofit organizations, and federal government agencies. Her mission is to equip individuals with the capabilities, competencies, and confidence needed to expand their personal and professional effectiveness. We're also fortunate to have with us a guest speaker, Morgan Schrankel, who's an AmeriCorps VISTA leader with the Siena College AmeriCorps VISTA Fellows Program in Loudonville, New York. As a VISTA leader, Morgan coordinates professional development opportunities and provides mentoring for the VISTA team serving throughout New York's capital region. We'll be hearing from Morgan later on as she shares insights that she has gained by coaching her VISTAs on time management strategies. Now I'm gonna hand things over to our main presenter, Jewel Ware. Thank you, Andy. Good afternoon, VISTAs. And I would like to thank you for attending this session. For the last 15 years, I have thoroughly enjoyed having the opportunity to work with VISTAs at the PSO. For our time together today, here is what we hope you'll get out of this webinar. We would like for you to be able to recognize and control those time bandits that eat up your time. Identify actions to better manage your time. Um, be able to engage others in project timelines by building in time frames to allow for some possible adjustments that may be needed. And finally, access resources and tools for time management. The reality is time is a constant. It moves at the same rate, whether it's measured in hours, minutes, or seconds per day, regardless of who you are, where you live, or what you're trying to accomplish. Since everyone has the same number of hours in a day, why do some people get so much more done than others? It's a matter of the choices and the actions taken regarding time. It's realizing that not all things matter equally and finding the thing or things that matter most in your day. For example, as Andy mentioned earlier, Attending this webinar came at the expense of doing something else. The challenge then is not a shortage of time, but how you decide to use the time available. Let's take a closer look at the term time management. The reality is time management is an illusion because no one can really manage time. It would be great if you could save it, buy it, borrow it, or extend it. Unfortunately, you can't. What you can do, however, 
is manage yourself and how you spend your time. Although you can't increase the quantity of time, you can increase the quality of time. Time management is really self-management, managing the choices of how you allocate your time. The key is to focus your time on the important things and ignore the trivial or unimportant ones. Now, be clear. In this case, trivial items are those items that are not moving you toward your goal. You're always making choices about the use of your time. The question is, are they the best choices to achieve your goals? I would like for you to make a habit of asking yourself, what is the best use of my time right now? I personally have found this question to be invaluable. Many a day it has helped me get back on track to working toward my priorities when I've gotten sidetracked. It's also helped me realize when it's time to shift gears, when I need to do something different. Stop working, get up out of that chair that I've been sitting in far too long, move around just to get the blood flow going again. Maybe get up and get some water. We always need to take a break every now and then. This allows us to come back refocused with fresh eyes, clearer thinking, and increased energy and focus. So I encourage you, To get into the habit, ask yourself repeatedly, what's the best use of my time right now? And sometimes I tweak it a little bit and say, is this the best use of my time when I find myself doing something other than working on my primary goals? Now, we would like to hear from you. Which of these areas are the most challenging for you? Please answer the poll questions on the right side of your screen. All right, so the poll will be open for just uh, about a half a minute there. If you select your answer, then find the Submit button, which is in the lower right corner of your screen. Submit that. Your response will be registered, and then we'll get to see the results very shortly. Looks like we've got a lot of you who registered your response. Remember, you need to select the Submit button. All right, and now our poll has ended, and we're going to reveal the react uh, results. There we go. So it looks like the biggest uh, challenge was lack of focus um, with about 36% of those who, um, uh, of our participants uh, indicating lack of focus. After that came procrastination at 16%, uh, then drop-in visitors at 11, meetings were right behind that at 9%, um, and phone calls and emails seem to be the, the least distracting or, or challenging. Um, so, Jewel? Um, We'll turn it back to you. Okay, thanks, Sandy. So let's first define what those time bandits are, and it appears as if we all have some challenges with them. Time bandits are those areas that creep up on you, and before you know it, 5, 10, 15 minutes of your day have totally vanished. Add all this time together, and by the end of the day, you might be surprised how much time has disappeared from your day. So we will cover five common time bandits. First, let's start with drop-in visitors. So let's be clear. 
I am not saying that all drop-in visitors are time bandits. Let's face it. Communication is the oil that keeps organizations working smoothly. The issue is really a matter of degree. You want to continue the necessary socializing to make the connection and stop the unnecessary part that is preventing you from accomplishing your goals. So remove chairs from your desk. If you can't remove the chair, put some files or some materials in the chair so it won't be so inviting. People tend to stay for shorter periods of time when there isn't anywhere to sit. Arrange your furniture so it faces away from the doorway. Why? Oftentimes, people feel obligated to talk to you if they make eye contact with you. So by rearranging the furniture and making it less likely that that eye contact is going to happen, people tend to keep walking. Post a do not disturb sign at your workstation. Um, I know a number of people that actually use colored paper to show their availability. Red paper outside of their cubicle means stop. Come back later unless it's an emergency. Now realize it's helpful if you put underneath that paper available after 2 o'clock, for example. Green paper means come on in. Of course, you have to educate people as to what the colors mean and the reason behind why you are doing it. When we look at conversational cues, cues such as, I'm swamped, I have a conference call in five minutes, I will be able to help you after I complete this task. I'll get back to you this afternoon at 1 o'clock, or let me come back to your office when I have time. By you going to someone else's office, it actually helps manage the time better because you can get up and leave at any point. Physical cues, like standing up when someone comes into your office and remaining standing, tends to shorten the conversation as well. Now, of course, the assumption is that the other person is going to stand as well, so please don't invite them to have a seat. We will now move on to our second time bandit, a lack of focus. And if I remember correctly from Andy, this was actually the one that has the highest percentage of respondents. Whether you call it focus or concentration, let's face it, there are times when we all lose it. I don't know about you, but there have been times when I realized I've read the same passage three times and I still don't know what I read. That's a good indicator that reading it a fourth time is not going to help me. I need to do something else. Move, get up, stretch, touch my toes, walk down the hall, get some coffee or drink some water. What is important is that I shift that energy. Sometimes there's too much going on around us. So moving to a conference room if that's available, can be helpful. If you work in a cubicle, working in a room with a door, oftentimes is all you need to do to reclaim that concentration. Researchers estimate that workers are interrupted every 11 minutes and then spend almost a third of their day recovering from these distractions. Single tasking is focusing on one thing at a time. You know, for years, people talked about the importance, the significance of multitasking. Recent research has shown that multitasking isn't as effective as people thought. And I, for one, took pride in saying I was a multitasker. I could juggle two and three things at the same time. What the research shows is that multitasking is not effective when the task that you're doing requires concentration. For example, if you're folding clothes and you're watching television, you can probably multitask, but I would dare say at the end there were pieces of the program that you watched that you didn't even see or hear. You can do two things at one time, but not focus well on two things at once. 
sending emails while talking on the phone is another example of multitasking. When you do several tasks at one time, you might feel more effective and productive. However, the opposite is true, according to a Harvard Business Review article. While multitasking, efficiency has been shown to be reduced by as much as 40%. If you are a multitasker who wants to try single tasking, which is focusing on one thing, prioritizing tasks is key, according to Psychology Today. I then recommend make a list of tasks and start your day with the most important task. If you cannot focus on one task until it's finished, try sticking with it for 18 minutes. That's the point when the tension can start to wane, according to um, the Harvard Business Review. Then go to the next task and work on it for as long as possible. Claim an hour daily, or if that's not possible, if you can't have that power hour every day, Identify specific days, maybe Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. You need to make sure that people in your organization know that this is your power hour where you're going to hunker down and you're going to block out everything except focusing on a specific task. You'll be surprised how much you can get done in 60 minutes of focused, uninterrupted time. Notifications distract us from the task at hand. You know, getting those audible or visual alerts. When emails come in, um, sometimes we have alerts when messages come in. Turn them off because even if you don't check the email, even if you don't check the voicemail message, your your attention has been interrupted. And don't think just because you have it on vibrate that doesn't count. It counts as well in terms of distractions. Okay. Now let's move on to meetings. I conduct meetings throughout the country, and this is the area that elicits the most complaints and frustrations from people in terms of wasted time in their organizations. First of all, If you cannot identify a specific purpose for holding a meeting, then that's a good indicator that a meeting probably isn't necessary. You could transmit the information in some other way. Please remember that every meeting needs a path. It must have a purpose. There needs to be an agenda. The agenda needs to be sent out prior to the meeting to allow people time to process and get ready with questions or do any reading that may need to be done prior to the meeting. And finally, there should always be a limit. People should know how long this meeting is going to last, whether that's 30 minutes, 45 minutes, make sure that you include that on the agenda itself. Please make sure that you use the agenda once you have sent it out because it really serves as a roadmap in terms of where the group is headed. Also, if staying on time has been a challenge for you, putting a time limit in terms of different sections of the meeting can be helpful. You know, for example, the first section, we're going to, it's going to have 10 minutes in parentheses. The next piece may have 12 or 6. That tends to help keep the group focused. Make sure you set ground rules, especially if this is an ongoing meeting with the same individuals. It's very helpful if there are standards that have been established that people can be held accountable for. In terms of ending, never end a meeting without recapping key elements and agreed upon actions. It's always helpful if you can get the next meeting scheduled And you always want to send out meetings of the meeting for those individuals that did not attend, as well as a refresher for those that did attend. Rule of thumb, meeting meeting minutes should be sent out within 24 hours of the meeting. Now let's look at some strategies you can take if you are not conducting the meeting but are attending. When attending meetings, 
it's never too late to ask that ground rules be established. If it's midway during the year or you've had several meetings and you're not quite sure how to introduce it, you know, reference a book or article. You can reference this webinar in terms of increasing the effectiveness of the group. Ask if you need to stay for the entire meeting. The reality is many people often just invite everyone to a meeting without considering if their attendance is needed for the entire meeting. Having people come in for specific sections or to answer questions helps the energy in the meeting as well as maintaining momentum and moving the agenda forward. If the meeting is getting derailed, ask focused questions such as, how does that connect with the community meeting we're discussing? Or how does that tie in with where we are in the agenda? Critical point, make sure that it's done in a professional manner. Tonality is critical in terms of making sure that you don't increase defensiveness in the other, with the other people in the meeting. Now we will move on to a time bandit that I have to admit is close to my heart, and that is procrastination. If I am not vigilant, this is the one that will trip me up. Procrastination is doing low priority actions or tasks rather than high priority ones. Procrastination looks like straightening up your desk when you should be working on a report. You need to call your partners to follow up on a timeline, but all of a sudden you get this urge to start going through your mail and deleting old emails instead. The price of delay. I read a book that talked about the price of delay, and to tell you the truth, I also know that I am addicted to adrenaline. I like those adrenaline rushes. And so because of that, sometimes I wait because oftentimes I do projects and then I redo them because something at the last minute comes to me that I think is better, um, more creative, different. But here's the reality. One time, and I hate to admit it, one time I had a month to complete a project for a client. And it wasn't that I didn't have the time to work on it at different points. I just decided to wait until the closer to the end in case I got some great, brilliant flash of insight. And then a week before the project was due, I got sick. I mean, like in the bed sick where you can't do anything. Now, how does that look when you've had a month to complete a project and you have nothing to show for it? There really isn't an excuse that's acceptable. So I want you not to be put in that situation. So even if you feel you do your best work at the bottom of the eighth inning, start working on it so at least you have something that you can expand, something that you can show for. Also, the price of delay. Oftentimes we're still thinking about the project even though we're not working on it. So we're thinking about it. Sometimes we're worried about it. Also, what about the people that are depending upon that project to do their work? So oftentimes people that are caught up into procrastination don't consider the delay. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. The same goes for large projects. Oftentimes, you just have to take a chunk at a time and get it completed. Take a page from Nike. Just do it. There is one caveat I would add. Start it during your prime time, your prime energy zone. Your prime time is when you have the most energy and your thinking and processing tends to be the sharpest. For me, it's in the morning. But we all get caught up in habits that we haven't thought about. For example, a few months ago, I realized I was starting my days checking my email. That's not the best use of my time for me. It's better to check emails at the end of the day because when I come in in the morning, that's when my brain is moving the quickest. So why spend it checking emails? 
Assign a time limit for tasks you avoid doing. Uh, one practical, um, easy tip you can do, set a timer for 15 minutes and work on that task until it goes off. You'll be surprised how much you can get done with that 15-minute time frame every day. And oftentimes, once you see success, you start increasing the time, you know, 18 minutes, 25 minutes. Delay lunch or that task you enjoy doing until you complete it, a dreaded or unenjoyable task. Thinking about how procrastination fits into your work as this best, let's hear from Morgan. Thank you, Jewel. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to join you today. As Andy said earlier, I currently serve as a VISTA leader with the Santa College AmeriCorps VISTA Fellows Program in the Capital Region of New York. I will be providing some examples today directly from my experiences working with my VISTA team. Many VISTAs come into this position with a strong direct service background. And in the world of indirect service, you often have a lot more autonomy in your position. With this autonomy, autonomy, it is important to pay attention to the larger picture. Try to understand the culture of your organization. There is most likely a period of time that is busier, probably around a big fundraising event or a volunteer in recruitment cycle. Once you have a better idea of your organization, you can plan your VAD to work within this structure. During a busy, it's also important um, to work around these cycles. So during a busy cycle, you want to focus on high priority tasks. At this time, you might only be working on one or two major projects from your VAD. You will want to be sure to keep track of lower priority items to return to during a slower cycle. Some VISTAs that I have worked with become frustrated with how slow their organizations work. This often happens if there is a long approval process or additional funding must be received to move forward. If you find yourself in one of these slower cycles, there are plenty of ways to effectively work toward the goals on your VAD. You can expand on projects by researching areas that you are unfamiliar with or for additional res outside resources. During this time, you can make any resources or materials from your position transferable as well so that the next VISTA or staff member at your site um, who will be taking over your projects will have those resources easily available to them. Additionally, you can find ways to collaborate either within your organization or with other nonprofits and organizations in your area. I'll now turn it back over to Jewel. Thanks, Morgan. We're now going to move on to our final time bandit, telephone calls and emails. Plan and prepare for all outgoing communication. What does that mean? Identify the purpose and what's going to be the most effective medium to use. Consolidate tasks. As we've mentioned earlier, of being focused can really save time in the end. So if you have a number of phone calls to make, instead of just picking up the phone when you think about it, compile a list and do all of your phone calls at the same time. Um, send out emails whenever possible at the same time. Leave an out-of-the-office message when you are going to be out of the office, and that includes both on your voicemail as well as the out-of-office responder on email. Please use the two-line and CC line appropriately. It's one of my pet peeves when someone sends everyone the information on the two-line because oftentimes that means people are going to read it because they feel there is some action they need to take. Do not respond to all unless the message is pertinent to all. And have scheduled times to check voicemail and email. It's recommended a maximum of four times per day. Now, of course, if your position, you know, requires you to always be looking at voicemail, um, please don't say that Jewel said only check it four times a day. Now that we've reviewed five common time bandits and you've had some time to think about these, Let's hear from you about what you can do to address one of these time bandits. 
So in the chat box, please share one action you will take to reduce the time bandit. Please enter your ideas into the chat box and make sure you send to all participants. All right, so we've got responses coming in. It looks like uh, people have already picked up on some of your suggestions, Jewel. Uh, power hour, turning off notifications, uh, checking email only at specified times of the day. Uh, wow, the power hour is really gaining lots of traction here. It's trending. Um, <laughs> ah, taking breaks, stepping away, getting refocused. Um, yeah, so it looks like there are lots of common threads here, um, and and Jewel, uh, people are listening, and so they've already picked up on tips. Excellent. We are now going to switch things up a little bit. Using the poll questions on the right side of your screen, we want you to do some reflection. We'd like to know in which of these areas are you probably a time bandit for someone else. So once again, remember after you make your selection to click the Submit button in the lower right corner so that your reply or your response will be registered. And we'll keep the poll open for a few more seconds, and then we will reveal the results. Right, the poll is closed and it's calculating, calculating. Hello? Yeah, the results will be Hello? coming in just a second. All right, here we go. So it looks like, uh, well, there's kind of a tie for, well, uh, well maybe not. So the, the biggest, uh, Area in which people admitted to being a time bandit is being a drop-in visitor, and I have to confess that was mine too when we did this in rehearsal. Um, after that, lack of focus. So, um, so somehow uh, it seems like folks are creating diversion um, or somehow breaking up the focus of other Vista members. From there, then a procrastination, phone calls, emails seem to be tied after that. So, Jewel, back to you. Well, the poll wrapped up the section on time bandits, and I'm glad to see that many of you already have some ideas and suggestions in terms of how to address that, as well as being more aware of how you may be showing up as time as a time bandit for someone else. We are now going to shift into the next section, beginning with clarity around purpose. Let's face it, there was a purpose behind the organization submitting their application for an AmeriCorps VISTA member and the three-year work plan. Each year of the work plan supports the purpose of your overall project. We're now going to discuss specific areas to help us be effective when stepping into those projects. We are now going to look at what is called um, the PACE model and then look and see how it ties in with working with your partners. PACE stands for Plan, Assign, Control, and Evaluate. This framework, this model, 
works equally well individually as well as working with project management, working with other individuals, making sure that everything gets done well. So first of all, I would like for you to think of the PACE model as you have been given an assignment. Once you have been given the assignment, you need to start asking yourself a few questions in terms of do I have all of the information that I need? Are there some policies or procedures that I need to check into in order to be able to do a good job? Is there someone else that I might need to tap into? When we look at assigning, assigning means that we are looking at what are the resources, what are the tools that I need in order to successfully complete the task. Controlling, how will I know if I am on track, if I am meeting the deadlines? What do I need to have in place? What tools do I need? And finally, evaluation has to do with how will I know if I met all the deadlines? How will I ensure that I am being um, being on point? What are my milestones? How can I assess that I am really where I need to be in order to meet the time frame at the end. Now, what we need to recognize is the fact that the framework works both for the individual as well as for your stakeholders, as well as for your partners. I want you to take a moment and reflect back to the PSO. There was an activity that we did, the volunteer puzzle. It was where you got together with a group of people and you had to put the steps in sequential order. And if you remember correctly, many people put recruit stakeholders towards the end. As a matter of fact, normally, uh, not normally, but 98% of the teams put um, get stakeholders involved towards the bottom of the puzzle, and the reality was it should have been the third step. So when we use the PACE model, it helps us get the involvement of the other parties at the beginning of the process, which makes it easier for us to do our work. And so you can use the same model, the PACE model with partners, but the application of this model is applied slightly differently. So, yes, you're going to plan, you're going to um, answer the questions, but you're going to do it with your partners. The key word that I would like for you to note is communicate. Communication is essential while, plan while planning. Communicating with your partners, identifying the milestones, identifying the goals, identifying what's the end result that we want. And the more you communicate, the earlier you communicate, the stronger the buy-in is going to be with your partners. When you look at assigning, let's face it, as this is, you can't necessarily go to a partner and assign them a task. So you may want to look at it more as collaborating. And in terms of collaborating, the key word I want you to think of is schedule. You are agreeing with your partners to follow a schedule. And that's easier when you've gone through the needed steps of communicating everything in terms of what are we going to do, what's the standard of quality that we're going for. 
And so, once again, assigning, I would encourage you to look at it as collaboration. And it's really getting agreement with the schedule and agreeing who is going to be responsible for doing it. Control. I don't want you to start thinking of being in control of the situation because oftentimes that can create pushback with partners when um, Vista started talking about what I'm in control of. If you start thinking about it in terms of follow-up, following up, making sure that everyone is on track with meeting the deadlines, that really tends to be helpful. And then the final step is to evaluate. And so instead of saying evaluation, substitute the word recognize, giving recognition to the fact that we completed everything on time. Or if you didn't complete everything on time, recognize those areas that were completed on time and then identify what kept us from staying on track and how can we control these, what can we do differently in the future. And even if you are necessarily going to be working with those people in the future, it's helpful they've learned something. Lessons learned are always applicable, whether you're going to be working with them now, whether you're going to be working with them in the future, you can always take those lessons with you. For each section of the PACE model, we're going to share some strategies and tools that you can use. We will provide a quick description of the tools, and you will be provided a list after the session of all the tools that we have mentioned. So at the end, you're going to walk away with a wonderful list of tools to refer back to. So now let's look at plans. Depending upon the industry, this is going to be really quick because planning involves long-term, short-term, weekly, and daily activities. And the reason we use the triangle or the pyramid is because as you get closer to the goal, usually there are fewer activities. The key is that every element supports everything else. If something isn't fitting, then that's a good indicator that something has been overlooked or you need to factor something else in. Uh, for our purposes, we may look at long-term as three years, the end of the work plan. It could be seen as one year, your year of service. And, of course, weekly, daily goals all need to support the plan. Setting priorities. Priorities are objectives that have been ranked in order of importance. If you're unsure, please check with your supervisor to ensure that you are both on the same page. Ask yourself, what tasks do you need to do? Uh, what might be able to be assigned, delegated, or shared? Have those discussions with your partners. And I would strongly encourage you to consider other people. Consider volunteers, community members, other coworkers. Sharing or delegating the work, even outside of a collaborative, can help build the capacity of the organization as well as empowering and lifting the community. Gantt charts. I have found Gantt charts to be an effective tool for both professional and personal projects. It allows you to have a visual. Not only does it allow you to have a visual, but it allows everyone involved in the process to see where you are in the project, what can be done simultaneously, the sequence the steps have to take, as well as the time frame needed. So how do you complete a Gantt chart? One, you list all the activities that need to be completed. You then identify whether it's going to take days or weeks for that task to be completed. You plot the task on the calendar. You schedule the activities. Now, here is a key element. You always need to build in lag or slack time. 
So let's say, for example, you know something is going, ideally it would take 10 days. You want to pad it a little bit. I would say sometimes people pad it by 20%, 25%, because you always, that will allow you to have a minimum amount of time that we can complete this task, and what's the maximum amount of time we need in order to still um, hit the bullseye, so to speak. And also, that gives people some additional time. Now, depending upon the people that I work with, some people, I let them know what the select time is, and I work with some other people that if I let them know how much slack time was built into the project, we still may not get it done. So it's up to you whether that information is shared or not. Now, let's be very clear about something. The Gantt chart is used in your longer-term projects. So I don't want you thinking that you need to use this for all projects because it would not be effective. And so here are two tools that can be helpful for you, Excel and Tom's Planner. Morgan, is there anything you would like to add to Gantt charts? Um, I personally have not used Gantt charts that often. Um, but I, another option that you could possibly use to collaborate on a Gantt chart is if um, you made it in the Sheets on Google Drive. Um, that's a good uh, tool that my organization has used to um, collaborate. So that way you wouldn't all be saving a different version of the Excel sheet. You could edit the same sheet um, all on Google Drive. Okay, thank you. And one comment, Tom's Planner can help you easily make and manage project charts. Um, it's a little less time consuming than Excel. We're now going to move on and look at assigning. And once again, assigning, I would like you to think collaboration, assigning slash collaboration. To be successful, it's always important that you have time at the front end to make sure that everyone understands you're on the same page in terms of what needs to be accomplished, what are our goals, what are our deadlines, what resources do we have available to us, because oftentimes that can impact on the time needed to complete the activity, as well as the scope of authority. It's important you let people know what are the decisions that they can make. The group needs to decide, to decide what are the decisions someone can make on their own and what are the decisions they need to come back and discuss with other people in the process. Once tasks have been assigned or delegated, someone must have control of the process to ensure everything is going according to plan. Morgan is going to share a little bit more about some collaboration tools you can use. Thank you, Jewel. I noticed some of you in the comments have been talking a little bit about Smartsheet um, as well as Google Docs. Um, I personally use Google Drive quite often um, within my team and managing projects. It's also something that I recommend a lot. So there are many online tools that you can use to make collaboration, collaboration very easy and organized. As I said, Google Drive is one of my favorites. If you already have a Google account, you can access Google Drive through the Google Apps section. Within Google Drive, you can create online Word documents, slideshows, spreadsheets, and even form surveys. All of them save onto your Drive account. You can then share these documents to others in the Google network by inviting them to collaborate. 
When collaborating on a document, you can add comments and notes and even chat within the document. You can also monitor the activity on a document to see who made the last edits. In our VISTA team, we use Google Docs a lot to sign up if we need volunteers for any sort of events. Um, also, right now, we have a shared Google Doc Drive folder that we used to plan a networking event. So we got all of our community partners together, and within this Drive folder, we were able to collaborate on documents to um, reach out for donations and to share meeting minutes. And by sharing this Google Drive folder, we were actually able to schedule less meetings because we were able to communicate through this folder. I'll now turn it back over to Jewel. Thank you. Great tips. We're now going to look at daily to completing a daily to-do list. First of all, Key word is list, not list. Too often people spend time looking for the right list. There should be only one. Also, sticky notes everywhere do not constitute a to-do list. The key is to write down your key task. Overestimate the time you think it will take to complete. Um, generally, it's been identified tagged by 20 to 25 percent because people tend to underestimate how long something is going to take. You then add the time up and see how does that compare with the hours in your workday, making sure that you calculate for lunch, you know, getting coffee, drinking water. Oftentimes people say to-do lists don't work because they have um, identified completing 11 hours worth of work in an eight-hour workday. And if you sub substitute or take out um, lunch, breaks, you have even less time than that. Also, time management identifies that you do not schedule every moment of your day. Rule of thumb, you schedule, you plan for about 75% of your day, and that allows time in your day for those unexpected items that you had not anticipated or that are placed on your plates at the last minute. Also, I strongly encourage that you keep your to-do list either in a binder or in a folder um, on your phone or email because throughout the year as well as the end of the year, it can serve as a reminder of those things that you did outside of your normal scope of work. Why? Because your to-do list tends to capture um, those extra projects or those more intense involved projects that you have and it will be really helpful when you are looking back over your year. Here are a few tools that can help you with to-do lists. Find what's most comfortable for you and use it consistently. That's the key. We are not here to advocate using any one tool, but find the tool and then stick to it. Here is a screenshot of Trello, which is an online tool that helps you make to-do lists. Like, it's like a virtual bulletin board. Morgan, could you share a little about your experience using Trello? Absolutely. I have used Trello a lot in my Vista term. You can link it to a Google account or sign up for a free account. Trello is great for organizing your daily to-do list by projects. You can then easily move tasks between your labeled project cards. Within your tasks, you can make more detailed to-do lists and check them off when you are finished. This is a great way to break down and organize your projects in a simple and visual way. Back to you, Joel. Thank you. We are now moving on. to overcoming information overload. Just three quick points. Realize that you're never going to know everything about any topic. So find out what you need to know and know it well. Trash, scan, recycle. When possible, throw away 
thrown away immediately after you have learned what you need. And finally, create and carry a reading file of reading material. Once again, it doesn't have to be paper-based. Going back to the PACE model, control. Tools only work, as I said, when they're used. The tool isn't as important as the consistency in using it. Please make sure that you schedule check-in points at the beginning of the process of working with someone. It's better to schedule more points at the beginning, especially if the two of you are not familiar with each other's love style and levels of expertise. Use open-ended questions such as how, what, where, when, where, and why are helpful in getting an expanded sense of where the other person is. Please make sure it comes across as curiosity and not as an interrogation. Being able to locate information when needed is critical. We are now moving on to look at various files that can increase your effectiveness. One way to help control how much time you are, in, are spending in certain areas of work is to track your time. You could use a kitchen timer, a cell phone timer, or there are also some online tools to help you track how long you work in certain projects, like the ones shown here. And so we have Toggle, Rescue Time, Focus Booster. Some filing tips, some files that we really encourage you to create, a tickler or a reminder file. Whether you put that on a calendar, it just serves as a reminder that you need to follow up with someone at a certain time, certain date. All of these do not have to be paper-based. They can be paper or electronic. Ideas and plans file. Maybe you come up with some great ideas. I have found that if you don't write them down and and file them away, when you try to retrieve that great idea that you came up with, it's gone. Having a file in terms of materials that you need to read, explore at a future time, and I personally don't go anywhere without having some information um, that I can read or review because you never know when you're going to be held up or something doesn't start on time. Please consider having a version control system. And that means every time you work on a file, for example, you would have one, you make some changes, you can make it two or one A because otherwise, oftentimes, you make some changes and then you decide that one of the first versions was the best, but you did not save it so you can't retrieve it, and that just adds additional work. And always, always, always have backup files. Here are a few resources that we've identified for organizing and creating files electronically. Um, Morgan, Morgan, could you share more with us, please? Yes. Two filing systems that I always recommend are email folders and Google Drive folders. It is easy to get overwhelmed with your email. Depending on your email provider, there are many tools you can use to declutter your inbox. Organize your emails is helpful if there is information that you want to refer to, but you might not want to have in your primary inbox. It is a good tip to only keep in messages in your inbox that you need to reply to. The rest of your email can be organized into folders. As I said before, I am a big fan of Google Drive. It also has the ability to create a shared filing system. Even if documents that you want to share are not within Google Drive, you can upload additional documents to these folders as well, like photos and Microsoft Word documents, for example. This can be very helpful when it comes to sharing information with your organization, especially when you're going to be transferring your files at the end of your VISTA term. Back to you, Jewel. Thanks, Morgan. So for those of you who already may be using these types of files, 
We would like to know which ones have you found to be most effective. Please answer the poll question on the right side of your screen. And make sure you hit to all participants. Yep, so this will be last call for your poll responses. We'll go ahead and close that down and get WebEx to compile the results for us. And it's coming up in just a second. We'll find out which of these file types have been most helpful for VISTA members and being more effective. All right, and it looks like the number one answer was, I don't use any of these. Uh-oh. Well, so there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, <clears throat> the number one, for, for those who are using a file, the, the top choice was ideas and plans file. And after that was, uh, that was 12%, and right after that around 9% was tickler or reminder files. So, Jewel, back to you. Thank you. We're now moving on with the PACE model, fourth step, the evaluation piece. The evaluation piece is about measuring how successful you were in reaching your desired results. It's always helpful to hold a lessons learned session with your partners slash team. This helps you identify what worked well so you can repeat it in the future, as well as refine those efforts that weren't as strong. And always remember to celebrate. We've shared with you a lot of different tools, and now we would like to hear from you about some of the tools that you find effective. As we mentioned earlier, all of the tools that are listed will be compiled in a list, so all of our listeners will have access to them. In the chat box, please share one or two time management tools that you find effective. Please enter your ideas in the chat box and make sure you send to all participants. Yep, and just in case your chat window is still closed because of the poll, um, click on the little triangle next to the word chat. It will reopen and you'll be able to submit your ideas. And lots of ideas coming in. So we've got Google Drive, Google Calendar, Google Docs, Google Drive. Google's very popular here. To-do list. Uh, and old school, using Post-it notes, sticky notes. Uh, Tried and true things like calendars and Outlook. Uh, OneNote, um, which is a tool we haven't mentioned, but um, is a cross-platform one. Uh, Trello, Google Calendar. Wow, so lots and lots of tools here. Um, we won't go through all of them because, as Jewel said, we'll be compiling those and making the list available. Um, so, Jewel, back to you. Okay, so we are now moving on to next steps because, as we know, Attending the webinar, attending training sessions is the easy part. It's actually implementing some of those actions. And so we would like for you to identify one or two new actions to begin. Please limit it to two because we want you to integrate those two and be successful. Um, get a support partner. Find someone who will support you in these new initiatives. It's important that you be intentional and consistent with actions for six weeks. Why six weeks? Because what you're doing basically is creating new habits. We just don't want you to take the action and then stop, but we really want it to become a habit, a way of doing things, having it operate on your subconscious level. And generally speaking, there are a number of dates out there, but six weeks in terms of work days appears to be the period of time needed before those new actions can take root. Experience success, actions are now habits, and then we encourage you to identify one or two new actions to begin and repeat the process.
And so as we wrap up this session, it's always helpful when you share, stay right down, tell someone some actions that you're going to change. In this instance, we would like for you to share one thing that you need to stop doing from a time management perspective. What's something you know? It's taking up time that could be better spent otherwise. Yeah, and we're seeing some of the uh, the classic time wasters or time bandits that we saw earlier. Uh, Facebook's come up a few times, drop-in visit. People are going to stop doing these things. Oh, listening to other conversations in the shared office. Boy, that's hard for me because I live in a cubicle maze, um, so I get to hear everything that's happening. Uh, prioritizing, um, using more focused time, maybe the power hour. Stop procrastinating. Stop checking email right away. All right, so lots of great ideas there, um, and keep them coming. We'll collect them. Uh, Jewel, back to you. Okay, and, and so I'm going to reveal the curtain. One thing I had to stop doing was playing words with friends because for a while I think I was addicted, and I would find myself playing it even during the middle of the day. And so now we're going to ask you, what's one thing you need to keep doing? You realize from attending this webinar, you know, I'm on the right track. This is something I need to make sure I continue doing. All right. So someone said not giving up. So that's a good thing to keep doing. Uh, keep collaborating. Keep cleaning out inboxes, managing email. Ah, a couple people talked about using music, calming music to kind of um, frame their uh, their workspace um, and using quiet uh, to create some space and an ability to focus. Um, To-do lists, very popular. Organizing files, organizing paper, um, again, managing email, using to-do lists. So, um, Lots of things we've talked about. So I think we can probably move on to uh, some resources, Jewel. Some, okay, some excellent resources. The One Thing by Gary Keller, Jay Papson, really gives you some specific uh, pointed actions to take. First things first, time traps, and then there's a time trap, which is considered um, the classic. It was recently revised, as you can see, in 2009. I think it was like the fourth edition. So great information for those of you that want to continue pursuing more information on time management. Great. Thank you for those resources, Jewel. And, and again, we'll be sharing those with you afterwards. So no need to write them down. We're going to move now into question and answer, but before we do, we We'd love to get your feedback. So uh, as you can see, the, the evaluation poll is open there on the right side of the screen. So we'd love if you would take a few moments to share your feedback, um, either on how we can improve uh, the session you're attending right now, topics we can include in the future, um, because we'd love to know how we're doing. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, question and answer uh, portion of today's session. Um, and I'm going to invite our operator, India, to come back and give us those instructions for how to ask, ask a question on the phone. Certainly. If you'd like to ask a question on the phone, please press star 1 and record your name when prompted. Again, that star 1 and record your name. If you want to withdraw your question, you may press star 2 to withdraw that question. So once again, that star 1, please make sure your mic is unmuted and record your name when prompted. One moment for our first question. Terrific. And if you're not on the phone, if you're listening, if you're streaming the audio online, you can ask a question through WebEx by using the Q&A feature. It's just above the poll, so it may uh, be closed there. You can click the triangle next to Q&A, um, type in your question, and try to be as specific as you can. So we'll have all the details before you click Submit. And while we're waiting for our first questions to come in over the phone, um, Jewel, we already do have some questions that have come in during the session. Um, so the first one comes from Rachel. 
She says, I have a financial literacy service project in three weeks. I've developed drafts of the flyers and a press release, but I can't do anything until they are reviewed by my supervisor. Would this be considered procrastination if I don't have anything else to do until they're, they're reviewed? No, I would not. Well, no. Direct, the direct answer to your question is no, it would not be considered procrastination in terms of that specific project because I'm assuming that until you get the feedback or the go-ahead in terms of everything being fine, that you can't move forward. I would ask, are there any other projects that you have on your plate that you could be working towards? Yeah, and if you know if someone has a to-do list, it's really easy to say, oh, this one's on hold. I can just move on to something else uh, that's there in the to-do list. Um, great. So let's um, we'll take one more question that's in the Q&A, and then we'll go to the phones. Uh, so Cassie says, I'm in an office with two to three other people, and there are no dividers, no walls. <laughs> what tips do you have for focusing in a loud environment? I try headphones but then others get mad when I don't hear them right away when they're wanting to ask me something. So the first question that comes to mind, is it possible to do telework? Is it possible at times or certain days or half a day, especially if you have a lot on your plate in terms of working outside of the office? Two, is there... Um, a courtyard, or is there some open space that you can go outside of the office and work in relative quiet? Um, third, maybe it would be possible to have a uh, power hour for everyone in the office at the same time. I also have a little bit of advice on that question. Um, my office actually there's me the other vista leader two other vistas and then another um different postgraduate fellow um and we although we have slight dividers we can all hear and one thing that we did was we created a noise calendar and anytime someone has an appointment that involves noise we put it on the calendar so we can kind of plan a little bit and we set some ground rules so that we were all on the same page. We also tend to use um, the chat within our email to talk to each other in case someone is wearing headphones. Great. Thank you, Morgan, for those additional suggestions. All right, so let's go to the phones and see if we have any callers uh, in queue. India? We do. Our first question is from Davida. Ma'am, your line is open. Uh, yes, I was wondering about the Tom's Planner for the Gantt chart. Is it a free tool, and where could I find it? Um, so uh, I'll jump in here because um, we saw that question come in earlier. Uh, there are several versions of Tom's Planner, so you can go to tomsplanner.com. Um, if, you're, if you're looking to do a Gantt chart for just a single project, you can sign up for a personal account, and it's free. Uh, but if you wanted to have multiple projects or a bigger organizational um, account where multiple people could be working on it, there is a fee for that. But if you wanted to just do one for yourself, uh, there is a free version that you can use, and it's tomsplanner.com. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Do we have others on the phone? We do. Our next question is from Philip, so your line is open. Hi, I was just uh, wondering where we get the list of the uh, different apps that you guys were talking about throughout the webinar? Were you guys just going to email that or something? Yep, so we will post that on the Vista campus. Um, so if you go to the webinars page, you know on the right-hand side is where we have the archive of all of our recorded versions of previous webinars, and then the uh, all the resources for each webinar are attached right there. So you'll see a link for um, the resources that we shared, and there'll be a separate link for the ones generated by participants. And you can just click and download it from there. It takes us about a week to get it all together and up there, um, but um, you can check back uh, on the webinars page. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
And there are no more questions on the phone lines. But once again, if you would like to ask a question on the phone, please press star 1 and record your name when prompted. Thank you. Great. Thank you, India. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, uh, along with the recording and the other resources, we will have a, a set of the slides available on the VISTA campus uh, as well, right there on the webinars page. Okay, we've got other questions here that have come in through the Q&A feature. So Larissa asks, do you uh, have any recommendations on how to deal with keeping on task and getting things done when I'm stationed at the reception desk in a small office where there are constant interruptions in the form of teachers and students looking for assistance? So it's a little bit different from the other one headphones really wouldn't be appropriate and sounds like, you know, she's, she's getting interrupted for legitimate reasons. So additional thoughts about that environment? And, and maybe she can answer this. Am I to assume that that's the only location they have available for her yeah. to sit? Has she questioned? Or whether she can be moved to a different location? Yeah, we, we don't have that information here, but, but that certainly is one piece to look at. Uh, from what she says, it's a small office, so, you know, I'm guessing maybe there's just not another space where she could sit. So, um, Morgan, have you run into this with any of the VISTAs in your project that maybe their work site, uh, you know, environment's not that conducive? Yeah, I actually have come across this problem before, and um, the VISTA ended up having a conversation with the supervisor, which I think would be a, a good idea in this situation. Um, another thing, kind of as I said earlier, it might be a good idea to keep track of the cycles, even within the day. Um, maybe if there's programming at one point and there's a lot of people coming in, um, it would be it would. I would suggest trying to find if there's any sort of routine and then um, plan your tasks based on that. So if there's something that, you know, you would need more attention for, um, try to do that at a time when there's not as many people walking in. But if that becomes a larger problem, I would suggest to talk to your supervisor to see if maybe you can block an hour or two hours um, each day or during the week to go to a different location and work on larger projects. Great. Thanks for sharing uh, that, Morgan. Sounds like a creative, uh, creative approach. Um, Helen asks for suggestions for managing drop-in visitors during the first few months of VISTA service when building relationships is so key. Well, you know what? That ties into the, what's the best use of my time right now. And at the beginning of um, working with people, especially as a VISTA, oftentimes the best use of your time is building those relationships and establishing com um, connections and building familiarity. Because there is a motto, it's called FCT, Familiarity, Comfort, Trust. And oftentimes before people will trust you, they have to become familiar with you and feel comfortable with you. And so sometimes the answer to your, that question may surprise you in terms of what the best use of your time actually is. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we've had a number of people asking similar questions about sort of the noisy or interrupted workspace. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, Daniel asks some questions about meetings. What do you recommend as far as note taking during meetings? For example, during this webinar, I was taking notes early on. However, I caught myself not retaining or absorbing much of the information that was provided. Uh, do you have any note taking strategies to share? And I guess that could be for either Morgan or Jewel. Great. So. One suggestion that, that I would have is to see if possible you could assign a note taker or even take turns. That way you can focus at one point and um, other people can focus at a different point. Um, I know for the webinar, obviously, it was just you listening. Um, but because the webinar is going to be made available, 
um, online afterward, it's possible that you could only take notes on things that were extra important um, or possibly things that you have questions. Um, so I would say to try in those situations to try to just limit the notes to things that you, you think are of, of most importance to you. This is Jewel. In addition, um, I would encourage you, instead of trying to take copious notes for any situation, take keywords, keywords or phrases, and then immediately afterwards, while it's still fresh in your mind, what those words or phrases mean, then transfer them, like rewrite them out in longer text. So take shorter notes, just capturing word, phrases, or key themes, and then immediately after, transfer them. And not only that, but that will um, tap into what's called the stickiness factor, and it will also help you retain the information better for a longer period of time. All right, some great strategies there. Um, let's turn back to the phone and see if we have any questions there. No, unfortunately, we do not have any phone questions at this time. All right. Well, we have plenty of questions that have come in uh, online, and we've got time for a couple more. So, um, so here's one that kind of gets right to the classic heart of time management. So Mindy says, do you have any tips for managing when people try to put urgent tasks on you that are low priority? either for your role um, or for the organization. And this is not just an occasional ask, but it becomes excessive. So how could she manage that? Depending on the person that's um, doing the asking, let's say for example, let's just say for example, it is your supervisor. Oftentimes, they're not thinking or considering all of the other tasks that have been assigned. And so sometimes just asking, you know, which is more important? Is it more important I complete this task or the task that you know is higher priority and it really taps into the goal? Or something like, you know, over the last three days, I have been given um, these tasks, but I'm not sure um, which order they should be completed in. Sometimes people just need to be reminded of the big picture, especially if it is becoming a habit. They may not even be thoroughly thinking it through is one suggestion. Okay, great. Um, and I think this will need to be our last question. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, so Montana says, uh, and this shifts a little bit between the professional and the personal. So Montana says, do you have any tips on balancing personal relationships with work? Uh, since I set my own schedule uh, for my VISTA project and the project is large, my friends and family have been complaining that I'm not making time for them. I can speak a little bit on this. Um, one thing that I encourage a lot with VISTAs is to create a work-life balance. Um, so just like you're prioritizing your tasks at work, you want to prioritize your life outside of work as well. And especially since you said you're making your own hours, find a balance. It's um, something that I found is that it's not a perfect system. It might, you're not going to finally um, one day find that you have a perfect work-life balance, but this is something that you might have to always work with and think, okay, this, this week I worked really late at work and I um, want to make time for my family or I want to make time for my friends and then make that time. Um, but it's really about the prior prioritization, I, I would say. Great. Thank you so much, Morgan. And, um, and we're going to have to leave it there. I know we have more questions, and I apologize to those that we didn't get to your questions. Um, but uh, we will be sharing additional resources, as mentioned. Um, we'll send out an email to everybody on the session letting you know when all of those are posted. And I'd also like to invite you um, to continue finishing the uh, evaluation poll if you haven't done that. Um, and then invite you to our next webinar, um, which is going to be really great. It's called Understanding Poverty Choices, a Behavioral Economics Approach. Um, 
We will have a behavioral economics professor from the University of Virginia, Dr. Ben Castleman, who will be talking about um, how and why uh, decision-making gets shifted for people who are experiencing poverty. So that's coming up on May 27th. Um, I really want to thank both of our presenters today, Jewel Ware and Morgan Schrenk, for their participation and all of the great information that they've shared with us today. And thanks to all of you for participating and for sharing your tips and suggestions on time management. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much.